Today, something a little different on the Honest Channel. I'm bringing you the incredibly inspiring story of Sarah MacDonald, who was diagnosed with not one, but two cancers in the same year. She was 44, living in California, recently married, and had just been appointed to a very senior role at eBay when a thunderbolt struck. In fact, several thunderbolts, one after the other. Now Sarah has written a book about her experience. It's called The Cancer Channel and you can find a link to it in the video description. And in this interview, you're gonna be taken on a roller coaster ride as we hear Sarah's story of a tumultuous year in which she experienced two cancers and three miracles. Prepare to be inspired. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me all the way from California. You lucky thing. Just, just north of San Francisco. I wonder if we could start, if you will, by going back to 2012, just before your world was, was turned upside down by cancer. Can, can you tell us where you were in life at that point? Yeah, sure can. Uh, so my husband and I had just gotten married the year prior and um, we were in the middle of fertility treatments because we got we got married a little older and knew that if we wanted to start a family, we needed to start in earnest and we probably would need some uh, medical help. So we're in the middle of, uh, of all of that. I had just gotten promoted uh, to a role that I really thought was gonna uh, give me a different trajectory at work. So I had just been promoted into chief of staff to the president of eBay. So things were, it was an exciting time for me. Um, and we were we were looking into IVF for the fertility. And um, while I was going through all those medical things, I noticed a lump in the floor of my mouth. And um, so I went back to my dentist and I said, hey, can we take a look at this? And she said, well, it's either an infection or there's a super, super rare form of cancer. I'm sure that's not it. Mm. And, you know, fast forward, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, it was that really rare form of cancer. It's called adenoid cystic carcinoma. And I like to call it badass salivary gland cancer, which of course no one's ever heard of because it is so rare. Only 15,000 people a year are diagnosed with it. And you were told at that time that this wasn't a curable cancer. Is that how they described it? It's treatable, but not curable. Yes. Which is a really, really important thing to understand. Um, Yes, my doctor said, yeah, we have we have treatments for this, but um, it, there is not currently a cure. So my my doctor said, you and I will become friends over many years <laughs> while we monitor this, which actually I needed to hear. I needed at the time to believe that there were going to be many years. And then the extraordinary thing was that you had had you had a lump on your breast, which you'd you'd had checked some time before and you'd been given the all clear. But when that happened, when you were diagnosed with that cancer, you thought, I wanna get that one checked again. And then that actually turned out to be cancer as well that had been missed for how, how long? In 2006, I had gone to my doctor with a lump in my breast and I said, hey, we need to ch check this out. Mm -hmm. um, had a mammogram, had some biopsies. And they said, you know, great news, it's not cancer. So I went about living my life. And when I got this first cancer diagnosis, I went back to my head and neck doctor and I said, you know, I have this lump in my breast. Is there a chance that it's actually metastatic salivary gland cancer? And he said, Sarah, you already have one of the most rare forms of cancer there is. And when that cancer uh, moves, it will move into your lungs or your brain which Claire, you know, was great news. Oh. And I said, oh, goodness. And he right. said, but, but not your breast, Sarah. He said, so if you were to have cancer in your breast, it would be a second primary source or unrelated cancer. And frankly, we just don't see that in someone so young. So mm -hmm. 44 was how old I was, which in, in cancer years is, is young. Yeah. In in uh, fertility years is old. So it was kind of a very funny thing there. But um yeah, so I, I, uh, he said, if if you are uncomfortable with this lump, you should go get it checked out again, and uh, I did, and it turned out at that point it was stage three breast cancer, and there were lymph nodes involved at that point, but I was actually just super, super lucky in that 
um, it was very slow growing. It was not aggressive breast cancer. Yeah. But still, that was not one, but two to take on board at the same time. Right. And, you know, you had been, you had been trying to conceive before that and you had then that, that then third blow, really, that the fertility treatment was going to have to be put on hold and you're already 44 and thinking, you know, that must have been a very, very difficult time. And then to compound it, Sarah, your father wasn't well either at that. Right. Yeah. Right. So just to, to kind of tell the story <clears throat> of the you can't have a baby. So my husband and I clearly knew that I had the two cancers and we were trying to process that emotionally. Um, it was a very unsure time because we didn't know the prognosis for either, what the outcome would be for either. And my breast oncologist called us both in and said, hey, I understand you've been pursuing fertility. She said, what have you heard about your fertility um, given these two cancer diagnoses? And I said, well, if, if I'm lucky enough to get through these, my understanding is we'd need to wait like two years and then we could start again. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, Sarah, I'm going to put you on a hormone suppressing uh, medicine for the next 10 years. And so um, you would be 54 when you finished. So no, no doctor is going to uh, perform IVF on you when you're 54. So I'm sorry, you won't be able to carry a child. And that was um, <clears throat> uh, really hard, hard for the two of us. And um, but uh, so we, we just focused on trying to get me well. And then Claire, you brought up yeah, sorry to just move it all in at the same time. It's okay. It's why I wrote the book. <laughs> it's kind of an unbelievable story. But um, in the midst of all of this, my my father had been diagnosed with prostate cancer 10 years earlier, and uh, his prostate cancer came back. Mm. And the way we found that out was it had moved to his bones. So it was now stage four prostate cancer. And um, uh, that was really hard on all of us. Um, Strangely enough, uh, for both my dad and me, it uh, it brought us closer. Mm -hmm. We actually went through cancer treatments together, uh, including chemo. Uh, we talked with one another every single day, uh, just checking in. And we could have conversations that we couldn't have with other people. So it was um, it was amazing to have like a cancer buddy. Yeah. Um, the tough part was uh, his cancer outcome was not as good as mine, and yeah. he. He died that year. And you already in in that one year had so much to take on board. And then and then your father died. And you must have been at that stage throughout, I'm sure, very frightened. I mean, just what, what, what was your mindset over that incredibly intense period of time? Yeah. So um, I would say uh, the fear, when I think back over the year, the fear was really concentrated on, on the first three months um, of both of the diagnoses, uh, my diagnoses and uh, the fertility news and also the news of my father. It was really, it was a sad, frightening time. <clears throat> and I will admit, I went to my doctor and I said, um, I am in constant fight or flight right now. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> I need help. I like my mental health is not great. Yeah. And I said, I am going to end up having a heart attack uh, before either of these cancers can kill me. So um, I asked for and was prescribed Ativan, um, which, uh, you know, was an anti anxiety medication that I was taking okay. daily. Um, meanwhile, I also started uh, one of my very closest friends is a yoga instructor. And she said, Sarah, you have some of the best Western medicine doctors working with you. She said, let's call those guys team one. Mm -hmm. She said, um, I want to be in charge of team two, the Eastern practices. She said, we're going to heal your body with the Western medicine, and we're going to heal your heart and soul <clears throat> with the Eastern practices. So I started doing yoga and meditation and some energy work and some acupuncture and actually, it was in really concentrating on those, it, as as Northern California as it sounds, really concentrating on my breath that I mm -hmm. was able to 
relax my amygdala where the fight and flight, fight or flight is located and, um, and just relax. And Claire, I believe that when you're able to relax your mind and soul, that is when uh, the Western medicine can be most effective. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that, actually. Just within the last year, I, I started meditating and I try and do that most days. And it's actually an extraordinarily powerful thing just to take some time out of your day to just not think and especially not overthink. I mean, I spend most of the time going through my shopping list and a hundred other, but if I can just get a few minutes yeah. there just to just to stop. Um, so, I mean, team two, how big a part do, do you feel that that played in in just finding your balance and being able to to look at recovery, the possibility of recovery? Yeah, I mean, I I would credit team two in the relaxation. I would credit team two in the helping prepare my body um, mm. to accept the medicine. And I, I think it's actually changed fundamentally who I am. I mean, I've always been, uh, you know, type A, um, hard charging individual. I, and, and, and it's not that I'm not that person anymore, um, but but it's softened my edges and um and it's helped me you know focus on what's important um did you believe that you would recover did you have that belief um certainly not in the beginning <laughs> yeah in the beginning um in in the beginning i wasn't sure i would i would see the year out mm -hmm. and Gosh. um and and that was a tough place to be in and i uh so i i was focusing on you know, if, if this is my last year of living, you know, how do I live it? And how can I be most graceful uh, in exiting? And so, so that, that was what was foremost in my mind, not trying to be melodramatic, just yeah. trying to, to, to really um, focus on that. But as I went through the treatments, all of, you know, the, the surgeries and the chemotherapy and the radiation, um, especially my breast oncologist just said, Sarah, your body is absolutely reacting the way we need it to react. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you are, you know, the chemotherapy is reducing the tumor. It's breaking the tumor up. This is terrific news. Um, you know, my, my head and neck oncologist surgeon just said, you know, I, I think we got everything out and we, we radiated the hell out of it. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, cause I, I was actually doing chemotherapy for the breast and radiation for the mouth at the mm -hmm. same time. And the fortunate or unfortunate, whichever way you want to look at it, um, chemotherapy actually intensifies radiation when they are given at the same time. And so when I was going through the chemotherapy for the breast, it was intensifying the radiation for the mouth. So yeah. it meant that two weeks into a six week protocol of radiation, they were seeing the side effects that they normally see at six weeks. So yeah. I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I had a lot of mouth pain. Oh, that sounded horrible. You had mouth sores as well. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. what a misery. That must have been awful. Well, and Claire, I mean, the the crazy thing is, um, I lost an incredible amount of weight. Weight because yeah. <laughs> there was a three week period that I I could not eat. And oh. um, yeah, well, because there were there were sores throughout oh, my mouth for no. twenty sores, and then it was like my mouth was sunburned. Oh. And I remember, I remember one day standing in our condo in San Francisco, and I had a small bowl of cottage cheese in front of me, and my husband is standing next to me, and he said, "I don't think you've eaten in two weeks. You have to eat this cottage cheese." Yeah, and I said, "Sweetheart, I just." Like it's too painful. Oh. I said, but you know, when all of this is over and I've gained the weight back, you and I will laugh about how I wasn't willing to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and so we sometimes laugh about that, or or yeah. I try to laugh about that. Oh no, it must have been miserable. And of course, you also endured hair loss, and you just um, you just shaved it off in the end. Well, I, so, so I, I, um, I have a lot of hair on my head and with the first chemo protocol, I only lost about half of it. So it mm -hmm. wasn't so bad. It mm -hmm. was, you know, it just looked like it had kind of thinned. And then with the second chemo 
protocol, it was so patchy that I um, had a woman mistake me for my mother because and, and not my mom doesn't have patchy hair. She just thought I was an old woman, an older woman. And uh, so I thought it is time to shave my head. So I did. And I was bald um, probably for about six months. Um, and it turns out it's really cold. It's really <laughs> super cold, you know, especially yeah. in San Francisco, right? Yeah. And I mean, how, how did it feel? Um... Was there any part of it that's empowering or is it just heartbreaking? Um, you, you know, it's funny, Claire. I, I thought it was going to be empowering. Yeah. I thought I was such a badass. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that I was uh, that vain. <laughs> yeah. I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, it ended up being tough. And I think part of it was it became a signal to people um, that I didn't know who I'd meet on the street that, that I had cancer. Yeah. In fact, I had a woman come up to me at a shoe, st at a shoe store <laughs> and, and said, looked at me and, and, you know, and my baldness. And she said, um, I'm five years past cancer. I just want you to know that there's light at the other end of the tunnel, which I so appreciated, but I was also horrified <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I she know. knew that I had cancer, but it was it was very kind and actually i do that now to people just to let them know yeah. you know there there's another side yeah um, they're not so, yeah so it was it was it was tough um i wasn't really into the wigs um uh some people i know who have gone through it have really gotten into the wigs mm -hmm. i was more a baseball cap gal mm -hmm. um the occasional scarf gal but this is the other thing you can only do cotton scarves because silk scarves fall off your head oh yeah true <laughs> of just, course no. yeah so it but it it ended up being fine and then since then you can see i've been on a hair adventure oh, since that's that great right? <laughs> Love so it. i have i have purple hair now but i um for the first five years post-cancer i was a platinum blonde and i have to say that was really fun <laughs> you're making the most of it <laughs> having yeah. your hair back um, in fact, Claire, if, if there's one takeaway, like you got to make the most of everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, over that time, did you follow any special diet or what did you do? Right. I, I talked with um, the head and neck surgeon about this. I said, you know, uh, was it something I ate <laughs> that led to this? And he said, you know what, Sarah, just eat real food. Just don't eat processed food. And we're not... My husband and I are not big processed food people to begin with, so that mm -hmm. that wasn't a hardship. Um, since that time, I have gotten to know a number of doctors who uh, really believe that a ketogenic diet can be helpful for cancer patients. In that, in a ketogenic diet, uh, you you cut out sugar and glucose, and uh, and cancer cells. It turns out they're not very flexible cells they can only eat sugar cells. So what you're effectively doing, you cut out the cancer and the glucose and the carbs. Uh, so the cancer cells can't feed, you're kind of starving the cancer cells. Meanwhile, you eat protein and you eat fat, a lot of fat and okay. your healthy cells, they can really eat that. So they're getting stronger and you're weakening the cancer cells. And then you bring in your Western medicine and uh, these doctors believe you can really have a much larger impact um on your cancer outcome so i that's, that's been really really fascinating um yeah. to read about and to follow um and so i i actually eat um not processed low sugar low carb now yeah um, I, I i probably don't eat as much fat believe it or not as as i should if i wanted to follow a ketogenic diet interesting but and but you eat quite a lot of protein we eat protein. It's mostly vegetables. And yeah, uh, yeah. my husband doesn't eat anything that walks on four legs. So we're, we're chicken and fish and that's, that's great. That's super. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds like a good diet to me. Um, and so I loved what you called your book, the cancer channel, because, um, and this really struck me that, uh, you just had cancer for that year running through your head like a news ticker the entire time absolutely we my husband and I talked about 
the the minute um, I got the cancer diagnosis, it was like somebody turned on um, a radio channel that played all cancer all the time. My earworm was, oh my God, I have cancer. Oh my God, I have cancer. Oh my God, I have cancer. And uh, it, it was just remarkable how hard it was to turn that off. Uh, oh, so imagine. yes, that's why I called it <laughs> the cancer channel. There's a very clear time um, before cancer when it's kind of like the age of the innocence. You honestly don't ever believe that you'll die. And yeah. then you get a cancer diagnosis or some other kind of life-threatening diagnosis. And you suddenly realize, um, oh my God, <laughs> that I am mortal. And um, life is precious and short and we must do with what is in our hearts. That is that is the, the epiphany. I love how you describe it as one year, two cancers, and now we get to the good bit. Three miracles. This is the good bit. So tell us the three miracles so um i uh i am now no evidence of disease for the adenoid cystic carcinoma the badass uh, salivary gland cancer i am no evidence of disease uh for the invasive ductile <laughs> carcinoma or breast cancer and then the third miracle and those are both miracles that didn't seem possible that year the third miracle is that two years post cancer treatment um, in talking with my breast oncologist who had told us that I would never carry a child. She let us know that there had been a, um, a new study in Europe where um, very willful German and Belgian women <laughs> took themselves off their cancer would medication. Not be told. <laughs> it's like, this is so funny. Um, who took themselves off their cancer medications against doctor's orders, mm -hmm. those rule breakers, <laughs> they got pregnant, they had, you know, they had babies, they went back on their cancer medication and they didn't have higher incidence of recurrence. Mm -hmm. So my breast oncologist said, if you want to try getting pregnant, let's do it. Oh. Now, now, Claire, I mean, this was, I was like, oh my God, yeah. you cannot make this roller coaster up. You can't. Yeah. So, um, because you had written the idea off, you had had to say goodbye to that idea. Right, yeah. we were we were actually pursuing um, surrogate options at mm -hmm. the time. So um, to suddenly be told, "Hey, this is a possibility." Of course, I had to talk my husband into it at this point because he said, um, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're going to go off your cancer meds," <laughs> and I said, "Yeah," and he said. I want some, I, I want some sort of a guarantee that neither yeah. of these cancers is coming back. And I said, sweetheart, mm. we never have that guarantee. And I want to carry a child like this. is This is, <laughs> you know, it's real. <laughs> this kind of, uh, you know, um, need visceral need um, to carry a child. And uh, so at 48, well, I, I guess at 47, I went off the cancer meds. And I had to wait, I think, three months. Then we did IVF. And surprisingly, I got pregnant on the first try. So that's, that's a miracle. Yeah. And um, I now have a six-year-old little girl named Rory. Oh, Scottish name. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's a great Rory name. McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Rory McDonald. Oh, we approve all over Scotland. We approve of that one. Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful and I mean after the time you'd had for all just to fall into place like that fantastic yeah. super lucky I and then I this is my husband and I say this I, I think almost every night when we go to bed we are just the luckiest people I am and I just want to be super super clear I got really lucky and yeah. mine is a story of hope um, to other people but I, I just wanted to come across how grateful I am um, I just feel very, very lucky that it that it all worked out. You've written the book and you hope really to share that message of hope with, with others um, going through a, a similar diagnosis and also to just it's a story of hope in general for all of us. Um, but I mean, for anybody going through um, cancer diagnosis and treatment at the moment, I mean, what would you say to them looking back? Is, is there anything that stands out to you that, that really helped you the most? Or was it just a, a kind of collection of things? 
Yeah, I think I think things lined up for me and that was great. I I end up actually talking to a lot of people who are newly diagnosed, um, sadly, um, friends and family and friends and family of friends and family, just a lot of people. And, um, you know, one of the things I remind them is one of the things my breast oncologist said to me very early on in treatments. She said, Sarah, there has never been a better time to have cancer. And I was like, wait, am I supposed to be happy about it? I'm, I'm not, to be clear, I'm pissed off about having cancer. Yeah. He's like, but she was like, no, Sarah, there are so many treatments. I mean, especially in the case of breast cancer, um, there has been so much money raised by amazing people. Uh, so much money raised that has gone directly into research. And so, you know, cancer, cancer research, cancer medicine, they, the doctors are coming out with, you know, customized approaches to people's individual cancers because it turns out you know every body is different and every yeah. cancer is different so um like the doctors are just doing amazing things so yeah. i try to remind people like like there's always there are going to be treatments and what you need is you just need the research to stay ahead of your cancer that's what you yeah. need and yeah. so I, I have people focused on that I, I tell people like you, you need to take care of your mental health. Like this is for me in some ways, the emotional, spiritual, mental anguish that I went through was harder than the physical anguish. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, mm -hmm. I had a whole lot of mouth pain. So mm -hmm. I, I had pain, but, um, but the harder part was just calming and stilling the brain, calming and stilling the heart and, and you have things you can do. Like, don't don't be ashamed or afraid to ask your doctor um, for anti-anxiety medication or whatever, just to 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 take the edge off. Um, but you also have terrific Eastern practices that you can try, that you can pursue. I'm not saying it's the panacea for all. Um, I have found it helpful. You, you know, it's kind of like exercise for your brain. Yeah, you know, which I think you were kind of speaking. Yeah, to. absolutely. So, you know, I, so I, I tell people like, remember, never a better time. Remember, you can take the edge off. And then um, a lot of us need to learn uh, to ask for help and support from other people. Um, get comfortable doing it because it turns out <laughs> when you get a cancer diagnosis, it doesn't just impact you. It impacts everyone around you who has similar fight or flight like fear that they will lose you and all like the the vast majority of my friends just say please tell me how I can help and what I say yeah. is like I, I can't be in charge of telling you what to do but just show up just show yeah. up for I need I need you here I need I need you the, the other concept in the book I talk about cancer island mm -hmm. when you are somebody who is newly diagnosed that 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 day of diagnosis, you suddenly fe feel like you've been placed on this island by yourself. And you can see all of your friends and family on the shore partying because for them, life is going on and you're on this weird cancer island. And what friends and family can do is throw a lifeline to Cancer Island, send a text, um, call, or just show up, you know, with a pint of ice cream. Um, all all of those things are good, you know, um, and and help to make the cancer patient feel less alone. Yeah, well, that is um, that is important advice and and probably a good note to end it on. But um, I've I've loved that. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's it's just wonderful that we we get such a a message of hope right there from you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I so appreciate you. Uh, having me on. This has been a great conversation. Thank you.